this time is um, incredibly valuable. And when Merrill approached me as part of the Marin Poetry Center about reading here, we talked a lot about how to take advantage of the, the tricky possibilities of this very medium of Zoom, of our disparate people. Um, and my poetic community, um, and for those of you who are signing on, I'm Liz Bradfield, um, but my poetic community is largely people who are not close to me. Um, the people in my daily life really are the far flung and they include people like Sean Hill, who <laughs> I met back in 2020 at Bread Loaf and we were Stegner Fellows together. We worked together on Broadsided Press and um, this summer I'll be teaching as part of the amazing conference that he runs, the Northwoods Writers Conference. Um, he is a core member of my poetic community. Also, Kali Lightfoot, who I first met through email and then met through a couple of um, non-university uh, workshops through Wellfleet Audubon, through um, a couple other places, and Kali, you'll remember better than I can, but as someone who is also really interested in how do our lives with natural history and poetry intertwine and how can we complicate those. And then Claire Benzadon, who was a student of mine at Brandeis University and has continued on to be um, just an amazing close friend and now um, an Instagram editor at Broadsided Press. And I think that, I think I wanna say that there's been a lot in the news for you, for you who have been following um, at Poetry Foundation about the problems of insularity, of nepotism, of um, inaccountability, but community is, Community is not that, right? If we have good community, we, we reach beyond that. Um, we seek to diversify our moments of power. We reach to ask for voices and visions that are different from our own. And so I'm really hopeful that tonight we can all come together and talk about those various moments. Um, Oh, I just got off script in such a major way. But uh, tonight, we're going to read a little bit about the poems of this moment that have been talismans and have been important to us as poets and as people. And um, I mentioned first that June Jordan poem for me, that idea of the song of the law abiding citizen and how law abidingness is not sufficient in this moment and how even the best of us, even the most good of us are being hurt by governmental actions. In her case, in that poem, by the movements of radioactive material through the streets of New York, so hot, so hot, so hot, so what? We, we want those voices to remind us or to give us um, an anchor to understand this moment that we're in, which is so precarious and so full of potential change and um, so hopeful in our ability to come together and enact not just personal change, but institutional change. Um, I think I've probably said enough. Um, Sean, can I turn it over to you? Yes, you may. You don't. You shouldn't, because you have so much. You have, you have so much more to say. I know. Um, thank you, Liz. Thank you for inviting me to be a part of this event. Uh, thank you, Meryl, for hosting it. Um, Yes, we, we met 20 years ago, Liz, yeah, in 2000, in Vermont, Bread Loaf, and um, 
it's been great getting to know you over these last two decades. Um, first, I think I actually met you submitting work to Broadside before we met as, as Stegners, in which you rejected one of my poems and accepted another one. Thank you. Um, <laughs> and yeah, it's, it's been you know, a wonderful sort of relationship of building a community. Um, I appreciate your coming again to my my conference up in northern Minnesota and being a wonderful presence teacher um, there. Um, you mentioned June Jordan, you talk about talisman poems. I, I am going to sort of share a poem that I think everyone's probably read at this point, but I'm going to share it anyway because there's sort of a story behind it. Um, after the, the video of George Floyd's murder, um, was shared with the world. I was on my text group uh, with my cousins, who aren't particularly poetry readers, right? Um, they're they're judges and lawyers and car salesmen and, and welders and florists and IT people and such. And um, we sort of ranged the gambit of, of shades of African American, from lighter than Rashida Jones to darker than Idris Elba. Um, but we were having this conversation about the pervasive structural racism in our country and the ways in which it impacts our daily lives. Um, one of my cousins reminded us that at Christmas he told his mother, quote, if anything ever happens to me on the side of the road at night and these white folks say I, was, I bucked or was drunk or had dope on me, they're lying and check into it. And that's when I was like, I should share this poem by Jericho. And I put this video of him reading it on Vimeo, Jericho Brown, Pulitzer Prize winning poet, um, his poem bullet points. And um, one of the cousins came back and was like, that's what he just said. And you know, that's, that's what poems do. Um, Brown's poem, you know, it, it, it voiced, it affirmed, it amplified and complicated our experience. And I'm just going to put that in the chat. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to read that poem. I, I, maybe I'll read the first couple of lines because it, it is that, right? Um, bullet points begins, I will not shoot myself in the head. I will not shoot myself in the back. I will not hang myself with a trash bag. You should watch the Vimeo video after you, you leave with us this evening and see Jericho do it justice. Um, and I think for me as, as, as a writer and a reader, like the work is, is getting to know the world um, in my body, but also in, on the page with you know, other writers and when I encountered Liz Bradfield's work, I was like, oh my gosh, like, this is a beautiful writer. I, I love the poems. There's one poem in particular I want to share um, because it, it, it gives me a glimpse or gave me a glimpse into the process of, of creating, of making, um, where it all begins, right? Um, the poem is from Approaching Ice and it is, it began with reading of At Arctic Adventures. It began with reading of At Arctic Adventures. Half an hour with coffee, marking up a book, a check to note sense, exclamation mark at astonishment or disbelief. Pages heavy on my knees. And then a day of my own work-related hazards, tempestuous blizzard of keys, avalanche of email, eye strain at the screen's glare, chair creak like something about to give way, snow fell, the street was plowed and salted, my dreams were white and treacherous, I walked as if the pavement's grooves were signs of where it could collapse. I wanted it to. 
Thank you, Liz. Hmm. You know. Oh, Sean. Uh, what, I mean, oh, man. Um, thank you. And um, I would love to hear a poem of yours. There are so many that I love that engage with snow and darkness and cold and remoteness and race and gender. Um, <laughs> there are, there are so many, especially your Minnesota poems. Well, right. both, both, mostly from your book, Dangerous Goods, that really yeah. engage with that. So why this poem and um, of your poems, what do you feel like it's in most conversation with? All of my work <laughs> in this way. So your that poem is like a touchstone poem in a way for me, the way that um, Kazarian by uh, C.P. Kavafi, Constantine Kavafi, has his poem Kazarian, in which the speaker is a, a historian, a scribe, who's writing about the Caesars, and he's writing about this one particular the son of Cleopatra, Caesar, right? And it becomes this persona, like the in the poem, he talks about the, the way in which not knowing so much because he was a little Caesar um, allowed him to imagine so much into that space. And, and he sort of, the Caesar comes, this little Caesar comes to life in this way, right? walks into the room of the of the writer in the poem and your poem is about that like how our our the power of literature does open up worlds for us like what you were talking about reading widely and, and getting a sense of like what is out there and what other people's lives are like is important right and that that's how it begins right that, that there's the, the way for me this poem is like that's my work i mean the, my first collection was about me sitting down and, and asking my grandmother about her life if i hadn't done that i wouldn't have written that book but then i had to read other books to figure out how to do that it's just asking her wasn't going to make my poems happen i had to read rita dove and yusef komenyaka and um ernest gaines and seamus heaney and and Kavafi <laughs> to write yeah. this book right yeah. um and I carry those people with me and I carry, and I think, yeah, go ahead. No, no, I think so much about your poems and I think about in dangerous goods, I think about the research that you've done um, to look at the, the slave trade um, and uh, the idea of blacks on boats, which is a series of poems in your book, dangerous goods. And the question of how, how do we have a different relationship with the water and how is that relationship with the water layered? And um, yeah, like how do we reckon with history, our personal history and the broader history? And I think that's um, something that I so admire and love in your poems, Sean. And, and I have to say that one of the reasons I wanted Sean to be here tonight is that both um he runs this amazing conference the northwoods writers conference and also because when sean and i um had our first books come out his being um blood ties and brown liquor and mine being interpretive work we we hit the road together and we went on this road trip um and through mostly oregon and washington um sean and i were stegner fellows at the time and uh, that that dynamic of traveling together and reading together and knowing each other's work together was such a bonding community moment and um, and I think that that seeking of community and that um, that surprising stuff that can happen when you solidify your moment with somebody else um, has been such a gift to me in so many times in my life and none so more than with Sean Hill, whose poems I so admire and um, whose friendship 
I so appreciate. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Um, so Liz, will you read us another poem? In response to Sean's? Uh, yeah, I will. Um, Sean and I used to do this thing when we were, when we were traveling together in our, in our quote unquote road show, which was not much of a show, but it had a lot of road. Um, but we would, um, we would respond to each other. Um, and I think that idea of originality and where things come from, um, I think I'd like to read a poem before we hear yeah. from Claire and Kali. I, I've been thinking a lot about this moment. It's Pride Month. Um, I'm, I'm gay, surprise. Uh, and, you know, this is a particularly difficult moment because the, the efforts of queer activists have done so much to make queer lives easier in the United States. And the efforts of Black activists and Black allies have <laughs> not done enough, have not done as much. And so in Pride Month, there's a huge reckoning right now of why, why is that so? Like, what is the, what is the racism behind that gap? Um, and sure, I've felt my moments of homophobia and I've felt my moments of personal, honestly, fear um, because of who I am or who I'm perceived to be. But, um, but here I am, right? Alive and reading to you. So I guess I wanna read this poem um, it's titled Site Specific Adaptations. It's from interpretive work from my first book. Um, and it's dated November, 2004. And I was interested in looking at biological terminology and how it applies to social realities. So site specific adaptations. This winter, I became a man. It happened the first week of November while my girlfriend guided photo tours of polar bears. For a week in Manitoba, she wakes, eats, and rides the tundra buggies with tourists over eskers, lending story to what they see. This year, though, another landscape competes with what's running the boreal tree line. She and I are on the ballot. Our home, our tax burden, and hospital visitation rights in 11 states. She's wary, bans talk of the election, but still, to some of them, she looks suspect, short-haired, short-nailed, with a walk that's wide and expects to be made way for. Out on the tundra, she tries to keep them focused. Look at the fox digging for his cache of meat, but no bears in sight. A bored wife turns from the view saying, so have you left anyone at home? My lover says, a cheer falcon. Until the last few years, we knew almost nothing of their nesting habitats. It's November 2nd, 2014. Four more days with this group, seven with the next. Then she'll come home to me. What weather they're having. Mid-twenties and clear. Bears at the bay's edge in golden light, testing the new ice, hungry for seal. Four more days in the buggy, four more dinners of careful talk. My husband is a poet, she finally says, for the first time, not risking this truth and hating that what she loves could bring her to this lie. Thank you so much. That was really beautiful. 
really moving. Yeah. And you know, I, I've had that same thought as you know, how is it that gay activism has made such strides and women's health issues, also women access to abortion, women's access to health care has gone in the exact opposite direction in the last 10 years, I think. And something about what activism is, we need to learn, all of us. Well, and how activism overlays with institutional racism and prejudice, right? Yeah, that, absolutely. And economics. Yeah. It's very it's definitely tangled, economics. It's a tangled web we're in. It is. But, uh, Kali, can we hear from you? Yeah, I think so. Um, the poem that I want to be read, I want to read mine as my talisman poem, is a poem by um, Lucille Clifton that's been on my kitchen wall for quite some time. Um, and I read it because I really liked it. It's called Blessing the Boats. I love boats. I've been to all the blessings of the boats. And, but um, I'll read it. Blessing the Boats by Lucille Clifton at St. Mary's. May the tide that is entering even now, the lip of our understanding, carry you out beyond the face of fear. May you kiss the wind then turn from it, certain that it will love your back. May you open your eyes to water, water waving forever. And may you, in your innocence, sail through this to that. And I read this the other day after the um, riots started, and I thought, oh my God, there's a whole other depth to this poem that I hadn't really gotten um, beforehand. And it, it just moved me greatly. It, um, so I wanted to share that as my poem for the period of time. <laughs> mm. And my, my cat is going back and forth and he may show across the screen at some point here. So. Mm. Anyway. Um, and my poem, well, first of all, thank you to Meryl and Liz and um, to everyone who is watching us and listening to us in this event. Um, I was just charmed to be asked. Uh, I did meet, I met Liz through, um, I met Liz <laughs> through the email and how that came about is I was casting about for a thesis topic for my MFA. And I happened to go out down to Bear Pond Books in Montpelier, Vermont. And they had a display of books on polar exploration. And I'm, I'm a great fan of polar explorers and all the old crazy Brits back in the early 19th century or 20th century. Um, and so I picked it up. I was thinking, ooh, maybe I'll do a thesis on polar poets. But next to it was interpretive work, which um, has on the back of it the poem No More Nature. And I read that and recognized it. I was a wilderness ranger back in the 70s, uh, the first woman wilderness ranger at uh, Mount Adams Wilderness Area in Washington State. And for 50 years, I have been wondering what that meant to me because I did it for three seasons and then left. And I've wondered for a long time why I left and what my life might have been like if I hadn't. Um, the district staff were grooming me to be um, a person in the regional office dealing with wilderness if, um, stuff. And I also um, knew that I carried that wilderness experience with me in a way I didn't really know how to articulate. 
So I thought, well, maybe I'll do something about that. So I emailed Liz and um, told her about this. And I asked her if she had any friends that were people who had worked in wilderness situations or wild situations and were poets. And I did a thesis as it turned out, she gave me some names and I did a thesis of interviews of poets who had worked in wild situations and um, asked them a set of questions, hoping to answer my own question in the process. And I loved it. I had so much fun. I didn't answer my question, but I had a really good time. And I got to know the work of Liz and of Michael McGriff, who was a poet um, who had been a logger. And Eva Solitis, Solitis um, who had been studying a pod of orcas on Prince, Prince William Sound. And um, Lucia Prillo, who was a park ranger on Mount Rainier. And the two, the two people that Liz had told me about were, her, well, three, herself, um, Michael McGriff and Eva. But reading this poem is what started the whole thing. So I would like to read it for you. It's no more nature. No more nature, we say after 14 hours on the water in August, skin ready to crack, lips too tender to close. No more nature in November when blackfish strand in the salt marsh and we've stood in sulfur muck as the tide falls out to dark, their breath whistling hard as we dig pits for flippers scraped raw by sand as vets try to predict which could survive until flood, which should get the syringe of chemical sleep. No more nature after the storm blows up while guiding kayakers across the bay, which means towing home the shoulder injury, prowl lunging the chop, tow rope cinching the gut. No more nature after waking before dawn to banned birds in first frost, shin after shin ringed with numbered metal, wing after wing teased from nets until we almost forget how frightened their small hearts made us when we first held them. No more, we can't take it, can't resuscitate our wonder, can't keep up with its unrelenting but then we have a beer, we take a shower, we decide to walk around the pond and look for turtles. After all, you could see a coyote lapping at its reflection. We could find the nest of a great horned owl that calls each night as we lie in bed, unable to not listen, unwilling to miss anything. So, that spoke to me, to the, the, the difference between having, being out in the wild because you have a job there and being out in the wild because you're appreciating it, which you are also doing if you have a job, but you have a lot of other things to do. So, um, and then I went, uh, how do I say it? In, I went, as I went through the book, the other poems that really stuck, stood out for me were the Butch poems um, and the one that you read, the site-specific adaptations. I've been there. <laughs> My site-specific adaptation happened to me in Mexico, actually. I was working with the Experiment in International Living and walking around Mexico City with the, direct, the Mexican director, um, who was an American. but. And she turned to me one day and said, so, Kali, what does your husband do? And without missing a beat, I said, oh, he's a therapist. <laughs> and I had to go home when I got home to apologize to my partner at the time, Paula, that I had um, changed her gender. But 
I did not feel safe with this woman revealing this part of myself. And um, I really appreciated finding a poet who made me feel safe. So um, I did have a few years of stalking <laughs> as I think I was signing up for workshops um, just to take them and learn more from her. And one thing I've really learned from her has been um, literary citizenship, which is what was spoken about in my MFA program as how we give back to the literary community and what, how we need to stay engaged for everybody, not just for ourselves. And I think I've learned that from Liz and um, working with her on broadsided and just being in her presence, the, the inclusiveness of her approach and herself. Um, and I have one poem of my own that I can read. And this poem to me speaks of our top, our general topic here, which is community, um, but in a way that may not be immediately obvious. I don't know. It is to me, but I don't know if it is to anyone else. And it also is another thing that, that comes to me out of that thesis experience that I had and, and working with the poets that I interviewed. It's called Star Stuff, which is a line I borrowed from um, the fellow on NPR whose name just went right out of my head. Star Stuff. The apples will not care that I didn't walk this morning or never learned a second language or read Proust or was not a better supervisor. Knowing that atoms of my body come from stars that died five billion years ago and will be available five billion years from now in some other body or star or drop of water or apple lying in the orchard path is oddly comforting. Red and purple sunsets from the bluff above the pond or Mount Katahdin on a full moon night, or a silent night sung by candlelight, or the smiles of my grandsons will be of no consequence to a drop of water. I may be as dust drifting, drifting on the solar wind beyond atmosphere and planet, untroubled and unconscious, this much worried, much loved life, atoms, Strewn, strewn across a galaxy of galaxies. Mm. Thanks. Oh, Kali, thank you. <laughs> thank you. And I think the question of how do we find, how do we find the people that we feel like reflect us and challenge us is a continuing question. And I guess I want to say that um, Kali, her first book, is going to be published by Colin Carey, which is such a beautiful press. Um, it's titled Pelted by the Flowers, Pelted by Flowers in uh, 2021. And um, I hope Thanks. you all will look for it. I really do. And I think, I think I might take this moment before Claire speaks to read, to read a poem that I feel like maybe speaks a little bit to that moment and that question of how do we understand um, ourselves, our social selves in relation to the natural history around us, because that's something that's been really interesting to me as a writer. Um, I know <laughs> I, I work in a community as on boats that is sometimes incredibly conservative and sometimes surprisingly not. But um, that moment of when you feel like you're safe to be your full self is a very vulnerable moment in a way on boats that is not always true um, on land. And this is a poem. This is a poem titled sex on the Amazon. It's from uh, Once Removed. 
and um, I worked for a few seasons on the Peruvian Amazon as a naturalist and guide, and it was it was great. I learned I learned so much. I learned so much, but at the same time, um, I was immersed in a culture that was not the same as the culture that I came from. And, um, and let's see, prehensile, of course, means like an elephant's trunk, things can curve around. And hmm, on the Amazon, um, on the Amazon, I was on the, again, the Peruvian Amazon working I guess I'll end there. Sex on the Amazon. Most of the monkeys we see don't have prehensile tails and pink dolphins seem too creepy for seduction despite the stories. We're watching howlers swing down from the canopy. When I first heard them, I was in the water. I thought they were a storm through rigging, but there was no rigging no wind, just those males roaring claim and dolphins beneath my treading legs. I felt the water they moved, but only saw them at a distance. Back in the skiff, it's all about the howlers, their noise, their coiling tails. I tell Carlos, I've seen orcas in Alaska loll and unfurl their pink hidden trunks, then twine them in air. Gray whales, too. Jorge, the paramedic, doesn't understand English, but gets penis and laughs. We go on. Most birds don't have a penis. I make my hands into tubes, bump ends for the cloacal kiss, except ducks. Jorge nods twirls a corkscrew above his lap, por el agua. We laugh in the back of the skiff. I am the only woman on the crew, the only American. When I first came aboard after my name, I was asked by each man if I had children. Do you have children? Do you have children? Do you have children? Pity, puzzlement, at no. Only Manuel, who is not the youngest, is not a father. New to this river, to them, I don't say much. After a Varzea walk with Juan, passengers talk about miraculous plants. One cures bronchitis, they tell me. One weans a child, and the sap of one can turn a man gay. I nod, look out past our churned wake toward jungle. Oh, tree, fronded, twined, scurried, and surely fluttered by morphos, deep blue as crepuscular sky yet shining, surely smooth trunked and buttressed to allow flamboyant sway. Why have I not seen you? Where do you flourish? Five weeks together on this boat, five trips, five groups for our repeated stories. This time, when Lucho asks about my husband, I say she. He doesn't seem to notice, but I say she about each other all the time, slippage of a romance language. On this side of the Andes, no one likes Mario Vargas Losa. In his novel, the women of Arquitos are hot, loose. Now they get trouble in Lima. Pablo's daughter comes to visit the ship. My baby, he says, she is 16. When a passenger asks about AIDS, Javier says, it's better now. There are programs and condoms. There are discos and nauta and Oquitos, and no one throws fruit during the parade, but, but hairdressers still travel the river. Beautiful canoe, cutting the bank, 
bright feathers bowed up the paddle shaft, parasols a bloom above groomed heads, and fine shears glinting like quick piranha. Who welcomes you when you land? Later, Javier tells me about a gay demonstration on the cathedral steps. Kissing, the face he makes is like the mouth of bitter sap. I know what I sound like here. He, she, five weeks together on a boat. We make jokes about the animals, do our jobs. One day, Carlos helps me ask a boy if I can try his canoe. They hold it steady, hand me a paddle, then won't let me go. Ridiculous. My she-husband, my childlessness, this dugout not built for the likes of me, that tree. I want to tell them its sap is the most delicious thing I have ever tasted. <laughs> really great. Claire, I think it's you. Well, I just wanted to also say thank you to everyone here, um, especially to Liz. Um, thank you so much. Um, it's It's been such an honor. Uh, thank you, Meryl. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Kali. Thank you all uh, to all my loved ones who are here. Um, it's, it feels like a weird time um, to be doing a reading, honestly. Um, but as Liz pointed out, um, I think it's really important to have community during this time. Uh, and, and to recognize the amount of uh, just love that is here right now. Um, so I'm just really, again, like super honored and just feeling so much love right now. So, and support. So I, I really appreciate that. Um, so the first poem I'm gonna read is by Ty Freedom Ford. I'm gonna be sending the link and then I'll read it. So let me quickly pull that up. All right. We get it back in the chat. And just so as a refresher for everyone who I had a brief introduction about Claire is a, an amazing poet and her bio is in that Google doc, but um, she was a poet of mine as an undergraduate, but has gone on to much wilder and amazing things as a poet in her own right. And I'm very grateful that we've kept that connection since I got to work with her as an undergraduate at Brandeis University. So Claire. Thank you. All right. So I'm going to be reading, it's called Still Life, Still Life uh, Color Study by Ty Freedom Ford. Saturday afternoon, in the driveway between buildings, they blow up balloons, yellow, red, blue, for a three-year-old's party. The intermittent pops startle me like random gunfire, remind me of birthdays brown boys will no longer celebrate. The DJ, having set up the speakers, begins to play. The music, a rapid fire, a bass thump, commandeers the apartment. We have no choice but leave. An art show, canvases colored with boxes and lines, a grid of red on a backdrop of yellow. We speak of the abstract with wine in our mouths. Meanwhile, in an antechamber, six are sequestered. They speak of malicious intent, blood, evidence, testimony, murder versus manslaughter. We arrive home to a throng of brown bodies, hand clutching red cups and music. It's insistent treble stabbing the ears. Inside, we slam all windows, but the music still blares as my niece shoots people on the video game. Its sounds are too realistic to bear. Instead, the news of verdict is in, not guilty, and everything is a blur of sound, my heart beating so fast I put a hand to my chest. I watch the TV screen, a collage of abstractions, spotlights, microphones, smiles, handwritten signs. I stare as if it were a painting, a smear of twisted faces, smothered in gesso and oil, a grid of red on a backdrop of yellow to make sense of. The party continues. The three-year-old probably in bed, dreaming of melted ice cream, and I am tired of partying. There is a police station half a block away, and I want it to burn. And 
instead only the smoke of weed, the meaningless music droning on, the popping of balloons. Sunday morning, the birds are angry. They're chirping a noisy chant, no, 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 no. Outside, the rubbery flesh of balloons color the driveway like spotches of, of paint. In an instant, these still lives of heave and breath gone in a pop. Um, so yeah, I just, I wanted to bring that poem uh, up first, just because I was kind of trying to connect all the different poems that I wanted to bring in. So the talisman um, and Liz's poem and how they connect together. And I was kind of thinking about space. Um, I was thinking a lot about space. So in terms of phenomenology, when we think of a space or we think about uh, where we are within, you know, inside con confines or internal spheres versus, versus external spheres, right? So in this poem, we have um, the speaker who is both inside and outside. So kind of being in the space of partying, right? But um, also, you know, kind of trying to having to be a witness of this reality of what's going on every day in the world. Um, just like I could kind of feel myself in now, um, you know, being in quarantine and kind of having to reconcile between um, just living at, <laughs> in, in a world where violence is happening um, constantly. Um, so yeah, uh, just a little bit about, again, coming back to how I, I know Liz. Um, yeah, I, I was an undergrad student. I really came into poetry pretty new, uh, in, into I came into Brandeis pretty new, um, started writing a little bit in high school, um, but Liz really changed my life um, to, you know, when it came to actually figuring out how poetry worked, both like, you know, form wise, but also, yeah, figuring myself out. Um, it was, yeah, life changing. And I'm, I'm so, again, so honored and so glad that I still get to continue writing and finding community, um, even in Miami especially in Miami, actually. Um, so appreciate that. Um, and now I'm going to be reading uh, from the collection Towards Antarctica. Um, I'm going to be reading the poem titled First Walk on Sea Ice. First Walk on Sea Ice. Weeks watching the bow cut through what's weak enough for not quite breaker us. Pull Lloyd's register ice class notation 1A. Captains an old hand at reading leads ran supply ships somewhere north of Europe in seas that gathered ice like a hoarder does newspapers. Stacked, falling, becoming architecture, now we're bowed in, wedged, docked in a slip custom fit. How to disembark? No gangway lowered right to it for romantic arrival, unsafe. Lower boats to open water abaft of midshifts, shuttled the ten yards from side gate to landing. I stick the flags they give, pulled from their quiver and ring what should be safe to wander. How do I know? Fluttered border, tracks of seals disappearing over another edge. Pose under anchor, camera angled for illusion of heft, for max pro loom. Run, flop angels, throw snowballs. Someone brings out a tennis set. Play on this non-land as we haven't on the continent. Sure, our tracks will soon be gone. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I love this poem for many reasons, but one of the things that I really appreciate is the pause in between every single action that we have here. Uh, but also that the last part, uh, you know, pose under anchor, camera angled for illusion of heft. We have such a presentation, right, um, of people on this non-land, right, of play, of the run, flop angels, throw snowballs. Someone brings out a tennis set. And then we get that play on this non-land, uh, you know, this kind of invasion of, of land by, by people. Claire, thank you. Thank it's you. always a little bit terrifying to ask a former student to, um, I don't know, it's so much pressure and uh, I don't know. It's, I, I'm uncomfortable and grateful and um, all at once. And I think in the few minutes like left to us, I would like to respond to everything that Sean and Kali and Claire have said. I mean, again, these are all people who to me feel very part of my community um, from people who have been there for 20 years, like Sean Hill, to people who have come in 
through surprising asides like Kali to people who have come in through more expected routes like Claire and yet have stayed in unexpected ways. Um, I, I think that there are beautiful ways that the poetry community connects us. And um, in this moment where we're questioning so many things about our institutions um, from our presidency to the role of our police to um, to major iconic institutions like the Poetry Foundation, what does it mean to be in community? What are our communities? And these are people who have felt genuinely to me like a deep communal uh, support, challenge, and um, umbrage. And I suppose in response to all of what they've said, I've got a list of things I'd like to read and say. Um, but I think I'd like to begin with um, the fact that, you know, it's, it's Pride Month. And yesterday was the anniversary of the Pulse shooting in Orlando. And there is so much going on right now. And I know that for me personally, that that shooting in Orlando was, um, it, 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 it knocked me down. It really did. It, it walloped me. And, and I am surprised that I was able to write from that moment, but I was. And, and I think that, you know, my work, my work in the world is both as a poet and as a naturalist. I, I get to work as a marine educator. I get to work with people and open places to them. So my fascination with natural history and my love of poetry have always been dovetailed. Um, and how that mingles in terms of my identity as a queer woman, like here I am, I look pretty whatever, but like my partner is a butch woman and I am really probably aware of the prejudice that she has faced and other moments as well. And the, the pulse shooting, um, it, 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 yeah. I think I'll just read this poem that I wrote in response to that moment. And also it, um, in response to the concurrent moment of gypsy moths devastating the landscape in which I lived gypsy moths, a species that were introduced because of capitalism to the new world. It's part of the poem. Um, and this poem was written originally in, um, in 2016, uh, immediately after that pulse shooting. And I just want to hold, hold all of those people in my heart and in memory. Dispatch from this summer, Lymantria dispar dispar, which is the Latin name for the gypsy moth. Frayed, moth-eaten, vulnerable, those Florida dancers gunned down and my young self coming out dancing and pathetic fallacy, dispar, dispar, crawls all over June's fresh oaks gnawing them to a February canopy. The news, bad oracle, gnaws fact and rumor. Above, unrelenting mastication, defoliation. Lymantria, destroyer, all else gone. You hump up even the stiff needles of pines. What will happen come winter, no sun stored? Should we spray? Should we shun social media, avoid large aggregations? How hot the birds must be, unshaded in their nests. Guilty thrill of peering down on them, black-billed cuckoos nesting. Other wings. The white towering stagecraft of angels, sentry at Orlando's morning. We considered what it would take to pick the trees clean. 
could we? The bark, the grass, the ground writhes. In a grove in China, a grim documentary. Honeybees gone, people pollinate fruit trees by hand. I twitch away from one caterpillar dangling from its thread, hanging by the silk that brought it here to the new world, to Massachusetts even, because some merchant in 1869, when Grant took the presidency and Elizabeth Cady Stanton spoke before Congress and the golden spike was hammered into Utah and the South fumbled through toward what's called reconstruction, the thought crop harvest riches and hoped the long expensive trek to Mulberry unnecessary. We gnaw through news feeds, we post and share, unsure if we are offering or consuming. In the forest, a constant heavy frass. On my side of the river, healthy trees, oak trees thick and dark. In the dance clubs near me, there is dancing, but introduction, dispersal, in the week after pulse, in Massachusetts, 450% more guns like the gun were sold. If you can stand to walk the narrow path through leafless forest, you can arrive at a circle of water that will allow your body to be beautifully held, whoever you are. It's true, you'll have to return by the same path, go back through those apocalyptic trees. If I had waited one month to begin this poem, I would have begun with the re-leafing, fuzzed red growth in late July, moth flutter among the trunks, not angelic, but like the paper corners that didn't get burned in someone's attempted or accidental arson. Is it too late? Now, plaster to bark, the russet humps of eggs that I scrape with a stick, vengeful, hopeful, despairing, even as they are being laid. And I guess I'm looking at the time. I think all of you have been here a while. I guess I just want to read a couple of more poems and um, express my gratitude to Sean and Callie and Claire for being here and for being in community. And I think that sense of community is um, for me so vital and so important. And my community of poets is it's not right here in a 10 mile radius, which is what I've existed in for the last five months, um, but it's uh, out into the world and toward all the people that I've known and asked questions of. And I've, you know, I've got this long list, I've got this slideshow, but I think, you know, it's 9.30. I'm gonna read a couple newer, newer poems. Um, one is not that new. It's a poem titled Learning to Swim. And the subtitle is After Bob Hickok and After Aracellus Germay. And I've I've been thinking a lot about how, how we can um, interrogate whiteness in our poems and how we can acknowledge the space we grew up in. Um, I've been thinking about Aracellus Germay's poems in her beautiful book, The Black Maria, which looks at the Eritrean diaspora. And I was thinking about Bob Hickok's poem, Learning to Swim, which examines his own uh, moment of exploration as a white man. And how can I complicate that? So this is a poem titled, Learning to Swim. And it was written a little bit ago, so there'll be an age marker in there that is not accurate. <laughs> Learning to swim. Now 45, having outlasted some of myself, I must reflect, what if I hadn't been held by my mom in the YWCA basement pool, her white hands slick 
under my almost toddler armpits, her thumbs and fingers firm around my ribs, which is to say my lungs, held gently as a liverwurst sandwich and pulled kindly under? What if I hadn't been taught to trust water might safely erase me those years I longed to erase or at least abandon care of my disoriented, disdained body? I might have dis drowned instead of just ebbed, never slid from given embankments into this other, other natural course. Drift and abundance and what she offered, the wider, indifferent ocean of trade and dark passage, not yet mine to reckon. And so now, sharp tang of other waters known, I am afloat, skin chilled, core warm, aware of what lurks, and grateful to trust and delight in our improbable buoyancy. And I think that question of, you know, how do we see ourselves clearly and how do we reckon with the privileges we've been given and the place we dropped into as babies, as kids, is something that's um, incredibly important to reckon with as poets. And I'm going to end with a poem. It's a new poem um, that'll be coming out next month uh, in the Atlantic. And I was thinking about um, the pandemic. And I've been thinking about um, our proximity to each other and what it means. I've been doing a lot of poems about word etymologies and what those words mean. Um, so this is a poem called, this is the first time I've read it out loud. Whoa. Um, poem called Touchy. Touchy, we say, when someone's sensitive, so touchy, so dangerous and delicate and ready to tip. Touching, though, is sweet. And we are touched by the gift, the thought, moved into knowledge of care, if not love. Touched, too, means crazy, God-kissed, the brain lit otherwise. I hope we've all known someone who has got the touch, able to ease a knot, make any machine hum, tune a string. And touch me, says Kunitz in the poem that always chokes me up, as if the hand of a wife would bring me back to myself or to the selves we both once were. Don't touch, first warning, the stove, the open sockets shock, the body unknown to you and all the bodies it in turn has willfully or not allowed such intimacy. <clears throat> when I first felt yearning for the skin I always kept hidden to touch another's hidden skin, it was the early decade of a different terrible virus. The danger was known and unknown both, and in some small way the risk of infection not unlike the risk of intimacy. In touch, when we know how someone is faring, touch and go, when we're not sure how things will turn out. So thank you, Sean and Kali and Claire and Meryl and everyone who came um, for being with us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you. Uh, Thank I you. Have to, I have to say, um, for people who want to stay, if you have a few more minutes, um, love to see the little slideshow you put together, Liz. We, I know many people probably have commitments and need to go.
but um, we did put it together and I'm, I'd love to see it. So if you don't mind, would you? I'd be glad to, but um, if for those folks who need to go, totally yeah. understand. Yeah. Like, yeah. Everybody who Zoom needs to go. Fatigue, et cetera. But um, I do have some pretty pictures and a couple of thoughts. So, but in the meantime, I'm just, I honestly, I'm, I'm so, um, I'm so grateful and honored by um, Meryl and Sean and Kali and Claire for being here and for sharing their words and for connecting uh, today. So yeah, I guess to avoid any awkward silences, I guess I'll like, uh, here you go, here's a pretty picture. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Look, look at that, that. All right, so for those of you who don't know, I work as a naturalist as well as a, a poet and the two are really critical. This is, this is a photo of a North Atlantic right whale swimming toward you. That thing above the water is the very top of the whale's head and below the water, you can kind of see a shadowy light thing, and that's the whale's tongue and lower jaw. And what it's looking for are these. These are copepods, plankton, about the size of a grain of rice. And um, if you look, you can see, see that little gleam of oil in the body these copepods have an oil sac and that allows these 50 ton animals to scoop up these little plankton that are again the size of a grain of rice and exist on them here's another animal uh, another view of a north atlantic right whale and again they're north atlantic right whales there are only about 400 of them left on the planet they're called right whales because they were the right whales to hunt. They floated when you killed them. We industrialized their slaughter um, before a lot of other species. Um, that kind of um, shaded comey thing you're seeing on the left below. Okay, so the weird pale um, pinkish thing with the things sticking up from it are what we call colossities. These animals have um, basically fingernails sticking out of their the top of their heads and those patterns are uniquely individual. The When you go down toward the water that even um, that even combing is their baleen. So these animals swim through the water with their mouths open, hoping to catch these rice-grained creatures in their baleen. The, the water goes in through their mouths and they filter that stuff out. Now, right whales were one of the first industrialized whaling species. Um, from the 1500s, Basque whalers killed them, uh, Cape Cod killed them a lot. And nowadays um, in Cape Cod, regularly because of climate change and I don't know, I can talk to you guys about it forever, but um, <laughs> a lot of these animals come through, this is a photograph of Long Point on Cape Cod, which is just, I could see it from here if I looked. Um, uh, a uh, little lighthouse, but we get about a third to half of the world's North Atlantic right whales in Cape Cod Bay, um, eating up those little those little planktons uh, every year. And that's awesome, but it's weird. It's a shift, and what does it mean? And also, um, what does it mean for those whales, which were hunted almost to extinction and today because of their long lives and different life histories um, they are not doing so well in our modern ocean um, and they are incredibly 
uh, troubled. And if you're on the Pacific coast, the North Pacific right whales are not having um, a better situation out there, but that's another story. But all right, so here's a poem that I wrote about this. And I do try and write about, I try and write about self and natural history in the best ways I can. Um, so this is a poem titled, Historic Numbers of Right Whales Skim Feeding Off Cape Cod. And again, you know, like, here's these guys, they were scary, like people came here, they didn't know, and they have this weird feeding mechanism. And here, the, the, the stuff they eat are these copepods. If you've watched SpongeBob SquarePants, then you have seen the copepods. This is what they are. They are these little planktons. They, are, they have a little antennae off the top. They have a red eye in the middle of their forehead. They're delicious. And this is what these huge 50 ton animals eat. Um, and there's a big bloom of copepods in Cape Cod Bay every spring. And if you're out on the water, you can smell them. If you're driving along, you can smell that plankton. It smells like melon, watermelon, cantaloupe. I like to say cantaloupe, watermelon. Anyway, historic numbers of right whales skim feeding off Cape Cod. Who would expect their appetite would come to seem ominous? But now I know they are voids of hunger. They plow a field of plankton, turn, plow again. They strip the water like loggers on a clear cut. The bay this spring seemed overrun by stern, enormous beetles, black, vaguely military, inexorable. Poor plankton, adrift in flailing clouds, poor blushing copepods with delicate antennae, watermelon scent. You don't stand a chance. Week after week, right whales eat the bay down until they have to leave it. Time and proximity have made them monsters. This must be how it was before. I read the Sex on the Amazon poem already, but uh, here's the images that I was going to show. This is um, a gang of killer whales of orca that were hanging out in Southeast Alaska. And that pink thing is a penis. And the other white thing is another whale's tail or fluke. And I guess what I want to say is that, um, you know, sex is different depending on what animal you are and killer whales orca in particular like many dolphin species are highly social and that socialization often expresses itself through sexuality and sometimes that's sweet and sometimes it's incredibly violent and uh, looking at that is really fascinating um, this is an image I read that sex on the Amazon poem of a pink river dolphin when I was working up in the Peruvian Amazon. And there's so many local stories about river dolphins. Um, and <laughs> I don't know, look at that thing. Like that is a really sexy dude. Because if you get pregnant accidentally, um, blame the river dolphin because <laughs> that is the problem right there. Um, I'm glad Claire read that first walk on sea ice poem. Um, the image that that poem comes from is from that book toward Antarctica and that question of what does it mean to walk on sea ice to be on a place that is ever new and never landmarked and what is it in terms of our colonial history of marking land is really interesting to me. So this is the image that uh, linked to that. Um, I'm going to go one. Ooh, okay. I guess um, I don't want to keep you guys too long, but 
I guess I, I really do actually want to end with this. I want to end with this poem from Toward Antarctica that talks about, I do work as a naturalist and a poet. And I think, you know, too often natural history and our social selves are kept apart. And I really don't want to do that, whether it's gender or sexuality or race or nationality. And this, this poem from Toward Antarctica, my most recent book, really kind of addresses that. I, when I work on boats um, outside of the United States, I'm with a crew that's wildly international. I mean, forget the passengers. Like, sure, they're international, but the crew is wildly international. And, and our dynamics among each other are so interesting and in how we rely on each other. Like, here we are, you know, hundreds of miles beyond radio contact with any supporting organization. If we don't work together, that's it. Right. And, and that to me is a hopeful moment, a challenging moment and uh, a moment that kind of lays bare a lot of the problems that we have there on these boats and also in the U S. So I guess I'll end with this poem, um, identity politics. All the maids are Filipino. Ditto bartenders, deckhands, some engineers. Sommelier from the Marquesas. Officers, mostly Eastern European, Scandinavian. Except the purser, he's Greek. Q, the joke trotted out at intros at, in year of debt crisis. Butler's Indian. The tallest of them, a fantastic dancer. This to be discovered one New Year's Eve crew party when riotously drunk. Argentinian gift shop manager, South African hairdresser, French concierge and maitre d'. So many cabals, so many bosses and job linked favors, disfavors simmering. Expedition staff, German, South African, American, Canadian, Dutch, Argentinian, one admitted queer, me, one known closeted can't remember the ship's flag, one of the cheap ports. We converge here on this all-owned land, here on this unbridled ocean, here on this world unto itself. So thank, thank you, you so much. everybody. This was really, uh, I thought it worked so beautifully. I was so happy to hear all your voices and your, some of your poems and Liz's poems and her thoughts, especially at this moment, which is so troubling and so hard to come to terms with in any meaningful way. It's really, really just what I needed. So thank you for that. And I want to remind all of you who came to buy a book, it doesn't matter whose book, now is the time to buy a book. <laughs> thank so. you, Meryl. Thank you for inviting us. And I think in the in that Google Doc, and I guess I'll post one more, I'll post the link one more time, but there's... Um, you want me to post it? I think I still have it. I'm like, I can just copy and paste. Yeah, I think there's there's links to everybody and, you know, Claire has her first chat book out and Kali has her first book coming out in 2021, which is so awesome. And Sean is running this amazing Northwoods Writers Conference. Yes, yeah, I went. So many people. It's terrific. Yeah. And if you guys want to come and join the Northwoods Writers Conference, Robin Wall Kimmer will be one of the speakers and Brenda Shaughnessy and uh, Alison Hawthorne Deming and Nira and uh, so many amazing speakers. So please um, speak it out, join us. Thank you so Thank much you. everybody. I'm gonna end the meeting now so you can all feel free to go. Thank you. Thanks Meryl, glad Thanks, to be here. Paul.
Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye, Sean. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>